Impact on my media prime this evening as a guest uh, for this edition of the program is uh, Dr. Fotung Babila, who uh, took the decision opting to go for um, the betterment of uh, Cameroon through the voice of a federation or a confederation. Before now, he had a different uh, position. So, in the course of uh, this edition of the program, we're going to be finding out uh, from him why he thinks that um, things are supposed to be seen from a different prism. Also, he's going to be telling us uh, what he plans to do to make sure that his new decision is uh, taken to a definite and successful end. We are very glad to have you for the very first time. On the point, uh, Dr. Uh, Babila. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Mr. Cooper, and a happy birthday to you. Um, <laughs> I was still trying to get my sound sorted, so I, I sort of missed out on your introductory notes. Okay. But uh, I heard that we are happy to have you for the first time. Okay. Um, so thanks for having me, and good, good evening to you. Yes, uh, Dr. You have been, uh, your new decision uh, to go for a confederation and a federation has been trending on social media. And many persons have been asking the question as to why this uh, change in position. Um, okay, uh, um, Mr. Kuhn, thanks so much for that answer. I think it's uh, the short answer is the change in position came out of the realization that uh, on the balance of the contextual realities of our unique situation, um, we stand a better chance at engaging with with uh, the government of Cameroon through a process of political participation, um, and it is imperative that we do opt for options that are being to preserve the lives of our people. Now, there are fundamental historical realities about uh, our, our, ourselves as people uh, that need to be addressed. But I have fought for the last five years for the establishment of a meritocratic, uh, democratic uh, Southern Cameroonian society. Uh, when I talk of Southern Cameroonian society, I'm making reference to the territory that is referred to in Article 1 of the 1961 Constitution that later on became West Cameroon and, uh, uh, and, and, and federated with, with, with East Cameroon. So for that specific territory, I, I came to the realization that uh, we, we want the people to be alive, to enjoy the, the, the liberal society that we are advocating for, the democratic society, the meritocratic society. And um, I, I came to that decision uh, and, and I'll just give a very practical example. The okay. day I saw a video on YouTube, on, on, on WhatsApp that was circulating with the head of a gendarme that was brandished alongside his boots and his weapons uh, with a couple of people celebrating next to it, it hit me hard in the head that we had lost our humanity. Um, we came from a society that is a peace-loving society to a society that became insensitive to the display of the head of a human being. And it dawned on me that we had unleashed a, a beast of violence that uh, once it gets loose and hits our society, uh, it does not recognize or respect its master. The guns that we celebrate today that are securing us victories that we, we clap and uh, talk about, are the same guns that are going to come down to haunt us. I live in a society that is a post-conflict society that has attempted 25 to 30 years of democracy. Now, the world stood back a couple of weeks ago and watched how the South African society degenerated into chaos when people went looting shops and uh, uh, invading commercial health centers. Now, that is post-conflict traumatic behavior. That is 25 years into a vibrant democracy. And people can still react and behave like that. So, Mr. Kuhn, my appeal to all Cameroonians, and especially to my brothers of the Southern Cameroonian Fraternity, is that we are in 2021. You know, the Eritians had to fight for 30 years to secure an independence that they are still managing to reap the fruits of thereof. Mandela was in prison for 27 years. Apartheid lasted almost 100 years. The Rwandans had to lay down 
one million souls in order to get the attention of the international community. And the list goes on and on. And I'm telling my people of the Southern Cameroons that when you unleash the beast of violence, for no matter how justified the reason is, it's a journey that once it leaves the bottle, it's very difficult to capture and to put back into the bottle. And when it goes out and starts consuming, it begins to consume today the people that were once its master. It knows no boundaries, it knows no friends, it knows no foe. It's been five years down this road, and I think it's about time that we do realize for ourselves what we are doing to ourselves as a society and call ourselves to order while there is still time to find ourselves before we go down that road. Once you have put guns in the hands of people and have, have made people to be used to finding solutions to every single uh, problem through the use of violence, it takes a lot of social engineering to re 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 reverse that pattern. Once a community and the people have had a taste of the fact that they can get everything through the barrel of the gun, it becomes a culture in democratic participation. That is why in the case of South Africa, we are sitting with 200 people who have lost their lives in the last couple of weeks because of the discontent with the way a specific president was treated. Violence is sweet when it's perpetrated against an enemy that has hurt you. But when you have unleashed violence, it is not civilized. Violence does not sit in lecture theater and take instructions. Once you have unleashed it onto a society and it hits that society, it goes wild and it eats left, right, and center. The issues that we are dealing with are principally of a political nature, and it would require us to find political solutions. Political solutions that says we must recognize each other's identity, our uniqueness, and talk to each other. So I believe, uh, Mr. Kum, that it's about time that we change the conversation. It's about time that we tell the people that when blood is spilled on the land, for those of you who understand the significance of these things from a spiritual dimension. You know, I go back to the example in the book of Genesis, Cain and Abel. When God came down to ask of Abel an accounting of Cain, an accounting of his brother's blood, um, the blood of, of Abel had hit the ground and was crying out for vengeance. Now, blood begets blood, and life is sacred, blood is sacred. When you get to a point where, as Africans, we start spilling blood, in order to justify the validation of our political positions, we have lost our humanity. And in 2021, we validate the stereotypes in the rest of the world that says that Africans are barbarians. They are barbaric. They do not know how to solve political questions that have to do with questions of identity how and dimensions of opinions. Doctor, so doctor, they think doctor, in doctor, all directions that the doctor, best way is to apply violence to the thing, kill each other and get to a point doctor, where when they attack each other. Doctor, doctor Babylon, how did we uh, get here? How do we understand? How do we uh, fathom uh, the fact that we have grown so intensive to uh, the scenes that you described at the beginning of this uh, program where we uh, very, very, uh, we would normally celebrate the beheading of a fellow human being. Is it the fact that um, there is no leadership? Is it the fact that we are sincerely very angry? Or how do we understand what is happening? Uh, 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 Mr. Kuma, I'm, I'm, I'm going to limit this to two issues. Okay. Um, now, let me put it this way. I think that it's a mismanagement of, of, of the psychology of the, of the Anglophone of the Southern Cameroonian. I feel that it is a mismanagement of the diversity of the two cultures and the two uh, 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 systems of governance. And, and let me explain myself. Okay. Now, this, this, this Anglo-Saxon man, by his culture and training and tradition, strives on respect. He has a different conceptualization of authority. Authority is service you know that's why they are they, they, the public service is called civil servants you know as opposed to functionaries the functionaries in, in french so i think we got here out of the misconception or misunderstanding on the part of the central government that the anglo-saxon man mentality and psychology is the kind that can be bullied into submission the way you conquer the mind of the anglophone is by the power of argument and logic so I think that we started off with a, a desire to be heard. It was a question that kicked off to say that, listen, 
we have come of age. A certain generation has come of age and has understood how we ended up in this arrangement that we now call Cameroon. And we are interested in revisiting the nature of these arrangements. Can we talk? Now, unfortunately, the central government was of the opinion that meting out violence and going out and killing and maiming people was going to kill the resistance. That is they dealt with the Bamiliki resistance in the 60s post-independence, and they felt that the same solution could be applied across the board. They failed to understand that they were dealing with the people who fundamentally do not back down at the threat of the use of force. Mr. Ba uh, Mr. Kum, in Cameroon for the last 30 years, which segment of the population has been responsible for the enactment of multi-party democracy? Who are those that too were ready to die for their ideas and actually died so that Cameroon should get democracy? So when you go out, out to people and think that you are going to kill the idea, it did not work. Yeah, but, but and how when you implement that how... process of trying to restore law and order by use of force, you unfortunately set it in motion of set in motion a very vicious cycle of killings that creates radicalization that pushes people to go the extra lens to make themselves help or to prove a point. That's how we got there. We came out with then guns and peace plans and marched and says, let us talk. The government came out with helicopter gum sheet and shot and killed people. Yeah, but now when you shoot and kill people, you push their back against the wall. And when you push people's back against the wall, because their point is so pertinent to them and they need to be heard, they are ready to go any lens to make the point that there's an issue we are not happy with. There's something that we need to have a conversation about. And whether you want to have that conversation today or after having gone down a cycle of 5 to 10 to 15 years of violence, we are going to have that conversation. Okay, but, but, but now, 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 now you, are, you, are, you, are, you are making the case. You are making the case for the reasons for what we are living in the southwest and northwest regions. But I am also asking you how we failed to use um, arguments of, because you said it is a political uh, problem which requires a political sit, uh, solution uh, to getting to the level where we feel we we feel uh, no 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 love for um, for for human life which you say is uh, sacred. How do we uh, how do we come to this point? Um, it, 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 violence begets violence. The human heart is accustomed to function in such a way that when you subject it to repeated, in, repeatedly intense levels of shock and stress, it loses its sensitivity. Now, when you sit and you are confronted with the reality of the way you are being treated on a repeated basis, it changes your psychology to justify the notion that a certain kind of reaction in intensity is a commensurate, acceptable, and measurable response to the treatment that you have received. It is inherent in human nature as far as their response to issues of violence is concerned. The human being is capable of levels of evil that we can are yet to see to fathom. And there are lots of examples across the world to justify that. Okay. And for sometimes for very, very simple, simplistic reasons. What is it that got into the case in the case of the Rwandan genocide for people to wake up and massacre one million of their brothers? It's a governance question. It's a management of sensitivity and diversity question. It's a leadership question. It's a misconception that you could manage a specific mindset in a particular way it's a combination of all those factors okay uh, uh doctor. But the important thing is that we ought to then get to a place where we wake up to the reality that we have gone further down this road than we should really have and change course and come back to reason and come back to the respect of life and the sanctity of, of our humanity doctor um how easy or how difficult has it been to take at the position and at the ground on which you now stand? It's not been easy. A lot of my comrades with whom we militated in the Amazonian movement I could not understand. They still do not understand. Um, I, have, I, have, I, 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 and of course, I've been insulted. I've been called all kinds of names, you know, a black leg, an infiltrator. 
But you see, I, I'm drawing inspiration from, 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 the, from the experience of Nelson Mandela. And I feel that leadership demands that when you advocate for the rights of a people, you have the responsibility to make sure that you attain your, your outcomes, having as many of those people alive and well to enjoy the very things that you are fighting for. Let me give you one specific example of this comprehension. It's the fallacy that some of my comrades have somehow sat down and convinced themselves of the notion that there is a benevolent international actor somewhere out there in the national community that can bring the government of Cameroon, drag them to the negotiating table, kicking and screaming, and compel them to, to grant independence to the Cameroon or make any certain set of adjustments that the government of Cameroon is not willing to do. Now, this is happening in an international relations context that is completely void of any expectation that such an eventuality is going to take place anytime soon. Mr. Kuhn, the only way we are going to get that negotiated settlement is at the cost of the lives of our people. It's when we have killed one, two, three, four million people across the board and have risen an international outcry about the fact that these Africans are killing each other, that the international community is going to pay attention. On the scale of activities and troubles in the global sphere at the moment, when you look at the situation in the Middle East, you look at the situation in Mali, in Central African Republic, all around the African continent, you are going to realize that in terms of the scale and the preparedness of getting up to the international agenda of prioritization, we are very down, very far down the list. What is the strategy to change that? To kill more people and make a case that there is a genocide going on and people are killing each other, therefore the international community should intervene. No, 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 Mr. Kum, the, the liberal, democratic, meritocratic society that we are fighting for, it is so that these people that we think are dispensable should live to enjoy that society. We are not fighting to sacrifice a certain segment of our population so that they should die and be wasted for the rest of us to come and live in a comfortable, free society. It compels us to change strategy, to engage, to treat it as a political question, and to trust on the reasonability of the actors who are responsible within the central government to address the specificities of the people of the southern Cameroons. In the absence of such a strategy that says, let us engage and find a political situation, a solution, we would be setting ourselves up to be a society that is going to be extremely violent, extremely wounded, that will take several decades to recover from the wounds that we are busy inflicting upon ourselves. Because on the one hand or on the other hand, people are choosing for whatever reason to be unreasonable. Okay. Um, we need to talk to each other. We need to talk to and each other. And find peaceful solutions. Now, you have been castigated uh, by many persons. Are you deterred? Are you uh, regretting your position? Do you feel uh, like having made a mistake? What is the mistake in such a situation? What, what would be the mistake in the case of this nature? Every liberation movement strives on three key strategies. An effective humanitarian strategy, an effective self-defense strategy, an effective diplomatic strategy. Let's take the case of the liberation movement that occurred in South, in South Africa. South Africa and the AS African National Congress benefited from support in a Cold War context of at least seven to ten African countries, including Libya, Zambia, Tanzania, Mozambique, Lesotho, Mozambique, Samora, Michelle, uh, Swaziland, I think, um, and out of the continent, uh, Cuba, Fidel Castro did not only provide logistical support, resources, trained the, the, the South African fighters, they also received training in Russia, 
within a Cold War context in order to combat apartheid in, in South Africa. The Ambassador Movement does not have that. There is no single international entity that has opted to logistically, financially, mythically back the Ambazonian movement at as at now. The ANC as a liberation movement was effective because it had people who were seasoned diplomats taking their issue to the political capitals all around the world to get sympathy. The very notion of black on white on black uh, uh, violence was emotive enough within the background of the, 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 the racial segregation and the anti-racism movement in the U.S. to form a combined coalition of a global movement against all racial discrimination. I could go on and on about the specificities and the characteristics of liberation movements that have succeeded. The characterization as at the moment and for the last five years of oppression, Neither on the diplomatic front have we been sufficiently effective to be able to buy support on for, for our cause. There have been a lot of sympathies. Look at every single report and every single comment that has come out on our case for the last five years. Be it from Human Rights Watch or Agrezi or all these other people that have commented, it has always been on the humanitarian consequences, cost of conflict. The conversation has not shifted yet to the merits of the case. The people who have taken an interest have taken an issue on the perspective of there is war in Cameroon. People are dying. They have not yet engaged the political front. Secondly, of all the people that have been internally displaced and of all the people that have become prisoners and of all the people who are refugees in Nigeria, for the last five years, our movement has not succeeded to build the kind of concern and solidarity that it takes to, to deal with the immediate consequences of this strategy of engagement. You cannot cause this amount of harm and, and damage in five years and not have the conscience to take responsibility within your means of the people that are suffering the immediate consequences. What would happen in the absence of such a strategy is that these very same people would turn against the movement and will fight it. Because at the end of the day, it is hitting them and touching them on their skin. I mean, you have prisoners who are sitting in prison who are struggling with health issues, who are struggling with nutritional issues. And we have people in, in the diaspora sitting and who are unwilling to put resources together to place people under sustained, consistent support. It is irresponsible leadership to not have a comprehensive approach to dealing with the the, 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 the strategy that we have adopted. And this has been my cry within the movement for the last four or five years. We need to show responsibility. There is no doubt that our case has merits. Historical, in terms of our, our experience in, in Cameroon as a country for the last five years, there is no argument about that. There is no argument about the fact that Fuman was a farce and the arrangement that brought us in here was under the expectation that would be a two-state federation equal standing and that it was there was no there was no presupposition that there was going to be a control of the one uh, of, of, of French Cameroon over the territory of Southern Cameroon. Those are established facts. Nobody argues with that. Now, but when you choose to solve the problem, you have a leadership responsibility to measure on an ongoing basis, the consequences of the choice that you take, and to take responsibility for those actions. Now, now, yeah, you... And one way of taking responsibility is to put in place measures to make sure that you are taking care of the people who have been affected by the crisis. And that has not happened for the last five years. Our internet is are seeing the one Yahoo they getting pregnant left, right, and center. And there are people in the diaspora who say they support the liberation movement and they're willing, unwilling to set aside $100 a month to set up uh, uh, co cooperatives or workshops for these people to come and learn new trades. So we cannot be fighting the, 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 the struggle and liberation on one arm alone. It's a comprehensive strategy that says diplomatically, humanitarian-wise, and then the, 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 the right to self-defense on the ground, as we often like to argue. Now, if we fail on any one of these arms, then the movement is sitting on one leg and it cannot be stabilized. 
okay or cannot be stable it cannot be uh stable you are opting for a confederation and a federation and that is uh, the crux of uh, our discussion today what is special in uh this uh setup a confederational uh setup or a federation going by now, the arguments um, you are presenting Mr. Kum, confederation yes. is the one system of government that successfully manages the specificities of recognized state entities to simply put it the difference between a federation and confederation is that a federation is an attempt to reorganize a homogeneous entity that has a, a, a common destiny and a common identity in the context of states it will be a state in the context of africa that it got its independence on a specific date and then decides that it wants to reorganize itself internally for the effective governance and management of its people and its resources case in point nigeria in the case of a confederation a confederation is an association of two independent states in our case or in the context of cameroon the southern Cameroons that secured its independence on the 1st of October 1961, and La République de Cameroon that secured its independence in 1960, who came together into a, an intended confederation of two states of equal standing. It says that these two respective entities have specificities and identity issues that are unique to them. That if you do not take care to manage those specificities, you would run into the kinds of challenges that we are facing. Now, I am saying that we need to go back to that arrangement. In fact, I'm making the argument that we do not just need to go back to the Constitution of 1961 because I've read that 1961 Constitution and it was really not a confederal constitution. Because in the 1961 Constitution, for example, an article, article that stipulates that the Prime Minister shall be uh, uh, appointed by the federal president and validated by the by the uh, uh, by the, 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 the what do you call it by the by the, the, the legislative body of the southern of, of, of the southern Cameroons. That is not true confederacy. True confederacy is the restitution of the, the government of the southern Cameroons that was parliamentary and had its own executive and that owned and managed the resources of the people of the southern Cameroons. Now, uh, um, and which prime minister was not appointed by the federal president, but was voted in by the parliament of the southern Cameroons. So you have an autonomous government of the southern Cameroons and an autonomous government of what was later that became East Cameroon that has its own issues that can choose to decide whether it wants to federate internally or decentralize internally. But then they confederate by coming into an arrangement that says, how do we coexist together while respecting the specificities that we each bring to this arrangement? Yeah, but um, this it is the best form of the management of the divergence of our identity. You think you think that uh, the special status arrangement does not take care of the specificities of uh, the people of the southwest and northwest regions? The special status arrangement that is the 2019 uh, uh, bill on the establishment of regions and uh, uh, regions, I'm forgot to have the call that. No, it doesn't cater for that. It doesn't cater for that because you are trying to 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 change the the a story building from the middle floor without addressing the questions of foundations. It doesn't scatter for that because in exactly the same way that the 1961 constitution created an all-powerful position of a federal president that determined the outcome of the governance realities of the southern Cameroons, it's exactly the same thing. We have an all-too-powerful centralized government that is defining for the people of the southern Cameroons how it thinks and feels that it should govern itself. That's problem number one. Problem number two, it is seeking to solve the southern Cameroonian problem alongside the Cameroonian problem. Okay. Which is problematic. Which is at the very heart of the frustrations that the people of southern Cameroon are feeling at the moment. Cameroon has issues. Cameroon is supposed to have a dialogue about a variety of its issues. But as far as the question of the southern Cameroon is concerned, it cannot be a repetition of the 1996 constitution that says that we shall have a broad-based decentralization for everybody. It should not be a repetition of the 2019 constitution or bill that says that we shall regionalize within a decentralized context. 
that's a unitary decentralized state, it would have to be a governance arrangement that says, you as Southern Cameroonians, we recognize your specificities in your Anglo-Saxon tradition, and we recognize your desire to self-govern yourselves, and we would then, through a consultative process, make room for you to determine how that self-governance arrangement is going to take place on the first basis, internal coherence, internal self-governance, and on the second basis, you as Southern Cameroonians, after having consulted with each other, will come back with recommendation as to how your relationship with the with, with East Cameroonians, with East Cameroon, should function. Which, by the way, I'm proposing that it should function by means of a clearly confederate, confederate arrangement where you have a president and one or two vice presidents on a rotatory basis, but where the Southern Cameroon statehood, as was conceived... Uh, by the funders in the initial arrangement is restored. Okay. This has proven to be the most effective way of governing diversity Doctor. all around the world. Whether Doctor. it be in Switzerland or in Belgium or in Canada, you name it. Doctor, this is... Um... And it is very... It, it is inherent to our Anglo-Saxon tradition. Okay, but... Uh, to govern ourselves. Doctor, you are opting for a confederation or a federation. We know that there are federalists uh, operating in Cameroon, uh, in the likes of Agbo Bala. We have uh, Dr. Simon Munzu, and uh, we have the likes of uh, Dr. Nick Nguanyam, who says he wants a confederation. Are you already uh, in talks with them? Are you discussing with them? I, I, I have been talking with uh, Dr. Nick Nguanyam. In fact, he shared quite a bit of information uh, with me as I told him that I was coming to this, to this uh, interview and, and he has very very interesting practical solutions for us for example the whole notion of the existence of 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 representatives of a central authority within the territory in the lives of sdos and governors and all of these people that come to remind our people that they are behaving like a colonial force as uh, honorable weber once said would not exist within a confederal arrangement you know the authorities within the territory of the southern cameroons will be voted by the people and designated to represent them as the people so decide. Yeah, but um, beyond Dr. Nick Nguanyam, are you also talking with others, uh, federalists? Or you intend to open up talks with them a little? It has to be a process of consultation. It has to be a process that says that we must sell to our people an agenda that says there is merit in effective political participation. And of course, that has to be with broad-based consultation. Consultation that is not only supposed to take place with the existing people on the ground, but even people in the diaspora. But let me say this, Mr. Kum. There is, there is, there is a slight challenge that we have with the broad-based federalist fraternity within Cameroon. Is the, is the dilemma of establishing whether the Federalist Fraternity should first pursue the resolution of the Southern Cameroonian question or should pursue the resolution of the Cameroonian question. Of course, we know that people are come to advocating for federalism. Of course, we know that parties like the SDF have a national footprint and they are caught up within the dilemma of whether they should advocate for the, southern, the resolution of the Southern Cameroonian question, which is going to make them be exposed within their East Cameroonian constituencies to be accused to be a regional party or whether they would focus exclusively on the Southern Cameroonian question. So, so that is a challenge. And coming from the perspective of the regions that are bleeding, coming from the perspective of why we are having this conversation in the first place, I am an advocate of the fact that as much as Cameroon has many problems and to which problems federalism could be a solution, I would rather see the bulk of Southern Cameroonian intelligence and mobilization ability focus their attention on resolving the Southern Cameroonian question. Now, I know that as we consult further, and I had a, a brief talks with, 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 with uh, Dr. Ngonyam, um, uh, Dr. Nick, on this question. I know that as we consult further, there will be a consensus uh, a position as to, the as to the most suitable approach to adopt. But personally, I am of the view that as far as the question of confederation and federation is concerned, Southern Cameroon intellectual capital should be invested to resolve the Southern Cameroonian question. And I'm going to tell you why. You remember our experience with the GCE board. 
Our experience at DC board was an experience where our fathers had to fight to have complete control of our educational system. And after they had resolved that, the backboard was given to East Cameroonians on a platter of gold without an iota of sweat having been shared by them. The resolutions of AAC1 and AAC2 and the, 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 the Owona Commission that introduced decentralization, it's a result of our fathers having fought and fought and fought for a federation. In this case, it was a broad-based fight within the context of multi-party democracy in Cameroon and the leadership of Ani John Frunzi and the SDF. But again, at every juncture in our history where we have sought to put the issues that pertain to us as a people on the table, we have always had uninvited guests on that table trying to have a conversation about their own issues. And that in itself is an element that profoundly frustrates us as a people. We need to have a conversation about ourselves. We need to have a conversation about issues that pertain to us. And we want those issues resolved with recommendations that speak to us. If it means having a three-tier dialogue that says we have a, an all anglophone dialogue, we have a dialogue with the government of Cameroon, and that we have an all Cameroonian dialogue, so be it. But let us not lump together and bandwagon the southern Cameroonian question under the Cameroonian problem. Okay. The Cameroonian problem is a governance problem. The Cameroonian problem is a it's a change in it's a it's a political transition problem. It's a preparation of the third republic problem. It's people preparing for an after Bia context. Doctor, doctor, doctor. That is not the southern Cameroonian doctor, question. Doctor, doctor Gabila, this is your new position. You say you are going to be consulting with other persons on the ground. How do you intend to carry this fight uh, forward? Are you also intending to engaging with others to create a political party that is going to carry uh, whatever you want uh, to see realized in Cameroon? Or how do you intend moving forward with the fight? Uh, 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 Mr. Kum, the... The, the, the process of political mobilization needs to happen on a step-by-step -step basis. Okay. It will be extremely premature to talk about the creation of a political party at this point because the priority for the resolution of the Southern Cameroonian uh, question has to be bringing this conflict to an end and creating conditions for effective consultation of the people of the Southern Cameroons. And my, my appeal to the government of, of Cameroon is that nobody should be afraid to talk. Nobody should be afraid to dialogue. Open up spaces. Create spaces for people to be consulted and to express their view. Because, incidentally, there has been a repeated question about the representation of the people that are purporting to talk on our behalf. It is imperative that in order to seek the long-lasting peaceful solutions, a space be created for an effective all anglophone conversation something with uh, uh, cardinal tumi and the the, the 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 community of faith in cameroon was championing up and onto his dead and understand that those initiatives are ongoing my encouragement is that the government of cameroon should encourage this initiative let the people talk talk to each other and come up with solutions as to how they see their future should be and to create conditions suitable for such a conversation to take place, there should be a move for peace that says grant general amnesty to the political prisoners and everyone who is in jail as a result of this conflict. Release those people who are the leaders of the people. The people, there are significant segments of our population as Southern Cameroonians that recognize Atoua Defo, Sisi Kujios Tabe, and all the leadership in detention as their leaders. And who would not accept to go into any conversation as long as those people remain incarcerated? So create conditions for us to have a peaceful resolution of this thing, release political prisoners, grant general amnesty, create a truth, unity, and reconciliation commission, and let us talk. Once we have been able to have that kind of a consultation as a people, I believe that the people will determine the most suitable way forward as far as political engagement and participation moving forward is concerned. Uh, Dr. Gabila, how far are you ready to, well, to engage this new front you are opening up? Um, are you taking it somewhere? Are you getting into uh, Cameroonian politics in the days ahead? Is that what you intend doing? <laughs> I, 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 I'll take that. 
I'll take that question as, as a Trump question, and I'm going to answer that a bit man. Okay. But, 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 on the more serious and frank and straightforward note, um, it's going to be very disingenuous, insensitive, and immoral on my part to talk politics when people are dying. Our priority at the moment is to make sure that we bring an end to this current conflict. Our priority at the moment is to make sure that we create space for conversation to happen about what would be the most suitable governance model that captures the aspirations of the people of the southern Cameroons, for which I am advocating that it should be in the form of a confederation in which there's a restoration of the statehood and the government of the southern Cameroons headed by a prime minister that is voted by a parliament. We start talking politics. Now, that would, for us to get to that level, the, the people would have to agree or disagree with that position. Yeah, but you said... But I am not of those who are of the view that political participation within the context of the current Cameroonian dynamics is the democratic way of finding solutions to this problem. It may sound as a contradiction, but I'm making the point and the argument that we are dealing with a unique solution, that situation that requires unique solutions, after which all other elements and factors of a secondary consideration may or may not be put on the table. Um, have you, before taking the decision, have you had uh, discussions with people on the ground? Uh, in the southwest and northwest uh, regions, and um, do you think they see things uh, uh, from your prison? Because I'm just uh, getting a message from somebody who says that um, on ground uh, they are speaking a different language while you guys out there in the diaspora seemingly are, are speaking something else. Do you have a feel of what they go through back here? To be honest with you, speaking. In, in a diaspora capacity, or as in a capacity of those sitting in the diaspora, it, it would be it would be an illusion. It, it, it would be blatant dishonesty if we suggested that we had a full feel of what it, this last five years has meant for our people on the ground. It's one of the reasons why, personally, I brought myself to a position where I needed to decide to say I can no longer continue in this mode of oppression that seems to take for granted the fact that the people who are paying the heaviest price are so to, to say in more lingual collateral damage the pain has been huge the consequences has been huge in loss of life in affecting of livelihood disruption of business kidnapping for ransoms insecurity and so on and so forth we hear those things we see the reports on social media it is not our reality and, and for that, on behalf of all of us in the diaspora who have once uh, driven this desire to be free with such insensitivity to what our people are feeling, I want to apologize to our people of Southern Cameroons for what we have put them through out of our desire to freedom. There's a huge human cost, huge human cost in disruptions of livelihood that has been meted on, on people, for which often the diaspora has been accused of being sensitive to this reality. For that, I want to sincerely and profoundly apologize to our people and tell them that we were motivated by the unique desire to do everything in our capacity to seek a better life for our posterity. It has had to come with undesired consequences on our people. I know that there are enormous efforts by our, some of our people on the ground to cut down upon the kidnapping for ransom to, uh, to make sure that some certain degree of sanity and law and order comes to the ground but those efforts would be grossly inadequate when compared to the magnitude of what is going on the ground we have every now and again attempted to see if we could send support to our brothers who are in the prisons but again on that front we have fallen short hugely we have every now and again wanted to see if we can mobilize support for our refugees again on that front we have fallen short hugely but do not throw us with the, as the baby with the bath water. See our intention to want to secure a better life for our people as a collective. And let us switch into a next phase that says we can collectivize our efforts to look for ways of finding the best solutions 
that will bring us the kind of Southern Cameroon society that we desire we, and uh, while we, we, without making all the kinds of consequences that it, we are currently making on our people. Um, now, Dr. Gabila, how has uh, the reaction of uh, the international community uh, contributed uh, to your current position? We have seen the international community consistently condemn what, what is uh, going on, calling on uh, both factions to do as much as possible to reduce uh, the pain on uh, the common man. And we have not seen much imposing, oh, there they, they, they have been calls from the United Nations for a ceasefire. We have had several calls uh, from different quarters, but uh, you also of uh, the opinion that the international community is not doing uh, as much as uh, expected uh, to put a definite end to the ongoing crisis? The, the international community functions within a framework of the relationship between nations that constrain the extent to which they can compel certain solutions to happen. The international community functions with a language that moves on a step-by-step -step basis of noting with concern the situation on the ground, calling on both parties to exercise. It's, it's a jargon that says we see what is happening there. We hope that you guys can get your act together and so that we will not have to add you to the list of the million problems that we have to deal with. The international community is an international community to which La République du Cameroon, the government of Cameroon, belongs to as a member state of the African Union and a member state of the United, of the, of, of the United Nations. At the level of the African Union, the African Union has a modus operandi that defaults every regional conflict to the regional authority. In the case of what we are dealing with, the regional authority responsible for our region is the CEMAC region. The CEMAC, as ECOWAS, deals with crisis in Ivory Coast and Senegal and Gambia and so on and so forth. CEMAC is expected to be the one that is supposed to take on our issue and bring it to the attention of the African Union. Who is the lead country in CEMAC? Cameroon. Who is the chairperson of the African Union? Uh, 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 Mahatma from, from Chad. For him to become chairperson of the African Union, he needs the endorsement of his sub-region, which is CEMAC. CEMAC and the countries of CEMAC need to send him as a regional candidate, and they need to support his re-election. It is that same person that has been received political support for his election as chairperson of the African Union from the government of Cameroon that you, we are expecting to take up an issue that the government of Cameroon has taken a position on for discussion in the African Union. It's not going to happen. Not in the current context. Within the context of African geopolitics, the big players, Nigeria, South Africa, and North Africa, they tend to play big brothers within their regions. South Africa is not going to come to the backyard of Nigeria to solve a problem in Cameroon, especially a problem for which Nigeria is a clear stakeholder. It's not going to happen. The point time when the conversation was going to be discussed at the United Nations Security Council and in the site meeting, the African group, incidentally, under a South African presidency, pressed the international community to say that the United Nations is supposed to allow the African countries to deal with the Southern Cameroonian question. Refer the thing back to the African Union. That is international diplomacy. That is how it works. So, South Africa leading the African group asked the United Nations to refer the matter back to the African Union. Which African Union is headed by a SEMAC presidency, for lack of a better word? Now, our people would not like to hear this reality about the function of the international community, but that is how it works. The only way we are going to get them to upset that modus operandi not forgetting that whatever it is that we push in terms of getting a resolution all the way out to the Security Council, we have at least three to four members that are waiting to veto it. China because of its business interests in Cameroon, Russia because of its growing interest in the sub-region because of what it's trying to do around the sub-region, and of course France because of its relationship with the Republic of Cameroon. So the odds are stacked against us. And this is one of the reasons why personally I came to the conclusion that and I'm not saying all of this to say that we should not continue our engagement with the international community. Of course, it should go on. But our people should be brought to create a realistic expectation about the possibility and eventuality of a negotiated settlement. 
Cameroon is a nation state within the international system. There is no other nation state, no matter how strong as a superpower, that has the political capital to compel the government of Cameroon to do anything that the government of Cameroon doesn't want to do. That is why it is our best bet. And again, I, and I give you a very practical example, and because these are some of the things that uh, were my considerations um, as I got to where I am at the moment. In the course of our activity in South Africa, I had an opportunity to speak to Reverend Frank Chikane. Reverend Frank Chikane was the chief of staff of Tabon Beki's presidency. He told me that at the time when they were about to negotiate with the apartheid government for the end of apartheid, they put the third party mediators, the so-called international community, out of the room and had direct negotiations with the apartheid government for the creation of a South Africa that belonged to all who live in it. The international community does not come, come cheap. The international community does not come without strings. When you bring the international community to come and impose a negotiated settlement, you will need the international community to maintain that negotiated settlement. And when, who, whichever party the international community is going to back to push that negotiated settlement in either direction, it's not going to come without conditions and without benefits. We do not want to mortgage ourselves, our future and the future of our children to some international party that is going to help us find peace among ourselves in exchange for that very same future that we say we are fighting for. But this is a position you've Wisdom had. demands yeah. that we, 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 we... I'm not saying we should completely change strategy. I'm saying wisdom demands that we adapt strategy and begin to engage La République du Cameroon and remind them of their moral obligation to go back to the expectations of the 1961 arrangement between John Bufoncha and, uh, and uh, President Amai, uh, uh, Abadou Aiju, and remind them of the uniqueness and the specificities of ourselves as the people of the Southern Cameroons, and remind them of the fact that there was never a conceptualization where we're going to have governors, geos, and SGOs bossing our people around our territory in the name of national unity. It was never conceptualized. It has not worked. And we are not happy with that arrangement. Doctor, and we doctor, want doctor, we have, doctor, we have two more minutes uh, to go. After taking this task, um, what next? What are your next uh, moves? Are you forming a movement? Uh, are you forming uh, a platform that is going to uh, be selling what you say you now are talking about? I'm, I'm, I'm going to lean on, on the shoulders of my big brothers, like Dr. Nick. Uh, I started speaking, speaking with Abubala. Uh, I've been speaking with a you know, host of other people. And I cannot pretend to be an effective actor to a Cameroonian, a Cameroonian domestic political stage from a distance. Uh, there are a whole lot of people who understand the contextual realities and workings of Cameroon way better than myself. I will be very happy to be part of a broad confederation fraternity that seeks to put meat to its ideas and engage an advocacy process that has a diplomatic strategy to engage the community of nations to put pressure to bear upon La Republique du Cameroon to return to the arrangement of 1961, a confederal fraternity that sees the suffering of our people the refugees, the internally displaced, and the, 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 the prisoners, and mobilizes resources to take care of them, to make sure that those who are currently suffering while we find solutions to this, to this problem become the subject of our concern. We take care of them. And of a confederal fraternity that formulates clear strategies, that moves away from a cosmetic discussion about the form of the state, to the details about the restoration of the government of the Southern Cameroon with specific comp competencies, a broad-based conversation that talks about the kind of institutional reforms that it would take to get the educational sector of the Southern Cameroons to de be detached from the current centralized model where there's a genie and a boss sitting in Yaoundé wanting to define how what, and what people are going to be taught all the way in do, to a Southern Cameroonian authority that defines a 21st and 21st century fourth industrial revolution ready educational curriculum that will be dished out for the territory of the southern Cameroon. 
That is the kind of conversation I want to have. And that conversation needs to extend from education to the re institutional reform in the judiciary system to, to institutional reform in the health system to institutional reform in the agricultural sector to local government to the parliamentary system to security and policing. Security and policing are very important components so that we should not have this uh, people who have no respect for human rights harassing our people on a daily basis okay. in a manner that is contrary to our expectation okay. and a series of institutional reforms with concrete proposals okay, doctor, of how we go from where we are. Dr. Uh, Gabila, we are, out of, we, uh, we are out of time. We may have to arrange another uh, discussion for another edition. Why not even continue the, this discussion on a different uh, platform on Prime? Uh, we may have to discuss more on that uh, maybe next week if you are available. But for now, we have come to the end of uh, this edition of The Point. We are glad to have had you on this uh, program. We say thank you for coming. Thank you for having me and good, good night to your, your, your audience. Okay. We also want to say thank you to you all who took time off to watch uh, the program this evening, especially to the production team that is working out here on a Sunday when almost all of us are resting in our respective homes. Uh, Eli uh, Desmond, uh, Christian Tebong, and those at the broadcasting, and not forgetting you, the, my Chavis, who is giving us moral support, and you, Tabi Tambe Bryant, who is supervising the work we do out here. Stay blessed. Bye-bye.